We are Group A for the Takaki Book Club. My I'm, name is Aisha. I'm Octavia. I'm Ingrid. Tootie. And we are summarizing uh, the parts from the book that we chose that were interesting. Um, I started off with choosing a story called A Hard to Remember. Um, from the book, he talks about um, his experience being stripped from his native land and basically being uh, forced to work for free. So I'm gonna read this little part that really got to me, I guess. I have never experienced anything of this kind before, and although not being used to the water, I naturally feared that element the first time I saw it. Yet, nevertheless, could I have got over the nettings. I would have jumped over the side, but I could not. And besides, the crew used to watch us very closely who were not chained down to the decks, lest we should leap into the water. And I've seen some of these poor African prisoners most severely cut for attempting to do so, and hourly whipped for not eating. This indeed was often the case with myself. In a little time after, among us the poorer chain men, I found some of my own nation, which in a small degree gave ease to my mind. I inquired of these what was to be done with us. They gave me to understand we were to be carried to these white people's country and work for them. This made me fear these people more, and I expected nothing less than to be treated in the same manner. Um, basically, I just think that it's, you know, really disrespectful to be, you know, stripped from your native land and forced to work for free. Um, I think that's why today is very important for us to, you know, keep on protesting, keep on fighting, because I feel like they're going to try to do the same thing to us. Um, you know, these gang members out here, they want to fight over territory and women. I think, you know, they need to fight like they did, you know, during the civil rights movements and the 70s, you know, and just basically stop all these senseless killings, exploiting women. You know, everybody wants to fight over popularity and money when people like, you know, Oluda had no choice but to fight. They took everything from him and he just had to you know, make it do what it do. He had to survive on his own. And could nobody help him. So, I think that was um, very, um, I think it was uh, very specific, you know, explaining just how he felt, you know, when he saw these people and just, you know, they made him eat the food he didn't want to eat. They made him drink stuff he didn't want to drink. And, you know, he was just all discombobulated and out of his character. So I just feel like um, if we don't fight, the same thing is going to happen to us. And that's it. You have anything to say about that? Anybody have any comments or plain no? I agree. <laughs> You want to share yours? Okay. Um, as we all know, I'm in Tavia. <laughs> so I did mine on a multicultural memory, and um, it talked about the different ethnicities that were placed in sh sugar plantations. Um, they were controlled by the Lunas. There were still like a lot of slavery going on in this book. <laughs> In this book, um, you know what? but you know it's it's all through the book, basically. Um, you know, slaves that were Chinese, um, slaves were Indian, slaves came in all different colors, except being white. You know, if if, if you were mm -hmm. white, then you know you were considered to you know, be privileged, but if you were black, Asian, or Indian, then you were automatically thrown into the slave or the indigenous servant category. Mm -hmm. And also, the white man plan was to get people to work for them, and they figured that the capital will follow. They had people working for very low wages, um, which wasn't fair, so 
the different ethnicities all started to come together and go on strikes to win their freedom and their rights. And um, another thing that stood out to me is time I, I noted it. Just a moment. Um, what's the name of the story? Oh, the book. So the other um, story was the vast surging hopeful army of workers. Um, there, it brought up the Declaration of Independence. Um, Jefferson believed that the king was trying to take the rights away from Negro workers, and he wanted to do something due to that, because of that. Um, what does it say here? So then the Civil War started. Um, the Africans was able to end the cruel slavery that was going on by fighting in the Union Army. Although workers was forced to work against each other, they still managed to cooperate. Okay. Uh, my story I chose was, uh, how can I call this my home by Li Chu? It's about a Chinese boy. He was in China, he witnessed a Chinese man that came back from America and he was wealthy and he started building his own mansion and he gave back to the people of his town. So that inspired Li Chu to go to America and seek a life and wealth for his family. So when he got to America, his first job was being a house servant and he was paid $3.50 $3 a week. And so in two years, he saved up to $410 and was ready to start the business. And he, the business that he got into was the laundry business. Um, Lee and his business partner followed uh, railroad and mine workers to be able to do their laundry. And the workers treated them like crap. So mainly most of the railroad workers and mine workers were white people. And they treated them like crap, stole from them. They were prejudiced against them and insulted. Insults and fraud against them, like they'll steal their clothes that they took in for laundry and say that um, the person, the next customer will come and say, where's their shirt? But someone else, someone else stole it. They did that on purpose so that the Chinese laundry person can lose money. And they did that because they were jealous of the the money that they were making and they were jealous of how their their workmanship was how they were pushing hard to make their money and then um, Chu explains how the Chinese in America are treated cruel and unfairly being for being hard workers and the reason why most Chinese start a laundry business in America is because it is one of the few options they have of making a decent living. And so at the end of the story, Chu says that he's confused on calling America his home because he is baffled at how Americans treat the Chinese because all they're trying to do is come to America to find a better life. And so the underlying theme of that story was basically on immigration, on how people think they're coming here to America to seek a better life, but they really aren't because they come here and get a bunch of bull crap. <laughs> Racism, <Or> discrimination, <laughs> discrimination, unfair wage, rain, yeah. rain, and all that stuff. Yeah. So that was that. That was the story I liked. And if you look at it in today's world, people are still fighting for um, wages to go up. You have high rent. Mm -hmm. um, High electric bills, high yes, bills. everything is high. high. Just and you're trying to feed your family and survive off of a minimum wage check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that goes into my other story, like black in the city, no time, no time to want. I mean, no time to wait. It's like talks basically talking about how black people in the '60s were trying to make it, but they weren't being taught how to read or write. 
so they couldn't get the white collar jobs, the good paying jobs. They had to, um, they had to. What was it Basically, teach themselves, or you know, try to find out information on their own. Yeah, and then the story says like the b black people will wait in the employee agency offices all okay. day and won't even be called on for a job or anything to be seen. And so it was just like I feel like it's history is just repeating itself, or mm -hmm. we still haven't made progress because that's what you still see at a welfare office is mainly minorities, blacks and Latinos and Asians or whatever. And they like they're still fighting. Like and then what most of them went on welfare. They didn't want to go on welfare. Blacks in the sixties didn't want to go on welfare because it was um they took away pride from them because they didn't want to get help from people. But then they had to because they had wives and children that needed medical attention. So that's why they got on welfare. But, yeah, they started to get that. Mm -hmm. yep. So it was just like segregation back then is still, I feel like it's still going on now because the majority of minorities are still in the same situation of trying to make something out of themselves, but the government just won't let us. <laughs> it's up to them to let us advance. And, you know, we always get stereotyped and. Just, just everything, you know, if you black or Latino, you, you come in with trouble, you know, either you want drugs or, mm -hmm. you know, you live in a projects, you know, they always going to stereotype you by that. Yeah. Um, I picked another story, it's called Fighting on the Frontier. Um, it's about a Native American soldier named Ira Hayes. Ira Hayes basically um, went to the Marines to basically fight you know, for his freedom and stuff. And then um, basically he participated in the evasion of uh, Iwo Jima. Um, and he did all this fighting and seeing all these people get killed and everything. And, you know, basically he ended up being a war hero. But um, what stood out to me is that, you know, after all that, you know, that happened, you know, basically um, the Native Americans still didn't, you know, really have any rights. Like, they basically tried to, you know, kick them out with the whole trial of, of, of tears thing. So basically, after the war, Hayes wondered what he fought for. Unemployed and depressed, he drifted into depths of alcoholic delirium and was frequently jailed for drunkenness and vagrancy. On January 23rd, 1955, Hayes was found on the street drunk. He had fallen and drowned in his own vomit. People shoved drinks in, in our hands and said we were heroes, he had remarked sadly. On the reservation, I got hundreds of letters and I got sick of hearing about the flag raising and sometimes I wish the guy had never made the picture. Basically, he feels like all all the fighting he did for freedom and democracy basically didn't really mean nothing because when he got out of the military, he didn't have nothing. You know, he didn't he didn't have no home to go to. He was homeless. All people kept doing was giving him alcohol, telling him he's a hero. And it's like, well, what did I really get out of fighting for this country? So I really understand him when it comes to that because, you know, I come from an era where my dad was in the Vietnam War and, you know, got out, didn't have nothing, you know, most of the people got on drugs and it was just really horrible, you know. And it's sad because, you know, they gave, you know, the people who got out of the war the GI Bill. Didn't mm -hmm. nobody want to rent to the blacks, they didn't want them in the white neighborhoods or nothing. So basically, the GI Bill really didn't mean nothing because they had all these funds that they couldn't use because they wouldn't rent to blacks. And then they're going to try to say that blacks were making the um, the the value of the um, property go down with. No, it was whites moving out. People was coming to pay them and tell them, oh, well, you're going to have some black neighbors, so I'll give you $5,000 right now if you want to move, if you don't want to be next to them. Like, what kind of stuff is that? Like, I don't get it. It's like, no matter what they give us, you know, we still have a hard time using it, you know, because they feel like, well, it's a handout anyway, so, and then it's up to them if, if they want to help us or not, so, I don't know, I just think that um, and all these wars are, are fought for no reason, there's really nothing 
you know, coming out of it is just us spending more money and just creating more problems that we don't need. And that's how I feel about that. Um, I was reading, reading Growing Up Puerto Rican in New York, and basically it was talking about how Maria's life and her family were basically living in welfare, and they will always depend on welfare. And I feel like I can relate to her the most, because my family and I um, were basically living under welfare. We'll have the, the social, the caseworker come over to our house monthly, and see we needed clothes, shoes, beds, backpacks for school, and food. And as for Maria's, um, the welfare worker will always come and see that if they just needed extra beds or not. And basically, basically my whole family and I will always um, depend on welfare, um, see if we could get extra money for schools and supplies. But like one day, my mother saw my father at home, always drunk, wondering where did he got the money from, where he was getting money from, and was giving him money, knowing that he don't have a job whatsoever. My mom doesn't have a job, so where is he getting the money to buy alcohol? If he could buy alcohol, why can't he buy food to feed his kids? Which was very bummer, because I would come home from school seeing him drunk, and eating what he could buy but not feed his children. And for, as for Maria, her mother was, was getting frustrated, getting mad, questioning where he was getting money, and same thing. He just bought beer and not food for his kids or clothes for his kids. Um, Maria and I, um, I, could, I could relate to Maria um, more about school as well. Um, she wasn't getting no money for school supplies, and neither was I, so I had to borrow supplies, but for her, she couldn't borrow any because they would judge her just because she was poor, and basically judging, like, oh, she's a poor kid, like, it's not socialized with her. Same thing as for me, I, I was poor, and they didn't want to give me no supplies to, like, help out, so she basically finished school to eighth grade and got pregnant. Cause she was seeing her dad getting drunk, so she started doing the same things, getting drunk, um, smoking. As for me, I just started drinking. As my dad sees, I would help me out, be happy, like he was happy. But it ended up me getting pregnant as well, as young. And for her, she had to just finish eighth grade and not go to high school. But seeing all the sacrifice she did for her parents, having no jobs, not went to school whatsoever, constantly fighting, drinking basically abusing each other, um, made her realize that she should go back to high school, finish school, go to law school and see if she could have a better life for her children. And as for me, I was like, I finished middle school, went back to high school, and now I'm getting an AA for sociology, seeing I could give a better life for my children as well, and not teach them um, the sacrifices I went to. I don't, I don't really want them to know so I'd rather show them better lives and better success. So that was mostly what the story was about. Her basically not going back, how her parents were living, basically showing her kids a better future instead of the past. Right. I mean, it's a cycle, basically. You know, either you're going to let the, the cycle repeat itself or you're going to just break it, bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was like the only one that actually graduated high school and her other siblings couldn't because they ended up doing the same path as the mom and dad. They ended up getting pregnant and see if they could get more welfare so they won't work. Yep. It usually happens like that in families. I have a, um, a niece who had a baby at 16. Her mom had a baby at a young age and you know, they depend on welfare and that's all she depends on right now. That's how I know that too. That's and how it's, it's sad because it's like, we need skills and, and things, but you know, and that's what brought me to another story about, you know, the riots. You know, if you don't break the cycle, then, you know, nothing's gonna happen. And sometimes people have to suffer the consequences of other people, you know, the whole Rodney King thing, you know, them, them Koreans, you know, the Orientals spent a long time building up them shops and businesses. And then I guess when the verdict came down that 
you know, the cops, you know, wasn't guilty. They just started burning down the shops and acting crazy and acting a fool. That's because we couldn't get no justice. But it was also sad for the shop owners because everything they worked for, gone. Gone. They don't understand. They just know that they work hard to live the American dream. But then you got, you know, crooked polices and the law and the judicial system. All this stuff been going on since day one. If don't nobody get in there and change that, it's not going to change, bottom line.